right, our next speaker has, uh, has come all the way from San Francisco, uh, where she arrived about 7 a.m. this morning on an overnight flight and has not slept. And yet, she's caffeinated, she's ready to go. Uh, her name is Kelsey Pedersen, and uh, she majored in economics, you know, wanted to go work in sales, uh, then sort of started finding out ways to automate little things in her job, you know, batch sending emails, writing little scripts, and started shadowing some of the engineers at work and realized that development was this cool, creative, challenging, and interesting thing that she wanted to do. Words people have never used to describe sales. Um, <laughs> so she started teaching herself to code, went to dev boot camp, uh, got a job at a startup like straight away because she's fantastic. She now works, works at Stitch Fix, which is a um, sort of online styling and shopping clothing website. Uh, I want it to come to Australia. Can we like please like hashtag that and make that happen because it looks amazing. Uh, there were about 60 engineers when she started and there's about 180 now two years later. So the company's growing and being amazing. She works with Rails and also with React. Um, and please welcome to the stage, Kelsey. Caitlin, thank you so much for that introduction. When we talked the other night, that was very impressive that you were able to summarize that conversation. <laughs> we chatted for a very long time. We <laughs> bonded a lot, so that's great. Um, okay. Yeah, like Caitlin said, I got in um, at 7 a.m. this morning on a direct flight from SFO, so I am highly caffeinated, um, and I'm excited to get going. I think we're good to go. Cool. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Kelsey Peterson. And today, we're going to be talking about simulating incidents in production. And so it was 3 AM, and I had just started working at Stitch Fix a few months before. And it was one of my first on-call rotations. And of course, I get paged. So I roll out of bed kind of in a fog. I open up my computer, and I see that we're getting errors in the application that it won't load. We need to fix this issue as quickly as possible since the users of our software uh, use it at all times of the day. However, at first glance, it was really hard for me to find information on the impact of the current incident. And so after quite a few minutes of digging through logs and graphs and alerts, um, I see on one custom dashboard, kind of in the depths of our dashboard folders, that we're experiencing an outage due to a dependent service being down. But it's a service I've never worked on before, so I'm not quite sure how to solve the problem. So what can I do about it, and how is it affecting our users? I think this is a story that a lot of us can relate to, and it's definitely not the only time that it's happened since I've worked at Stitch Fix um, over the last two years. We're expected to support applications um, within our teams, but we don't necessarily feel prepared or practiced in resolving these incidents. And so in this uh, scenario, we ended up solving the issue and getting it back up and running, but only after um, more than an hour of downtime. And it could have very well been avoided if we understood our systems more. And I think especially as teams and companies grow, our systems become increasingly complex, which makes it more stressful and anxiety-inducing uh, to be responsible for applications that you don't work on day in and day out. And I think most of us can probably agree, as Ruby developers, uh, we have two main responsibilities. One is building new features, and the other is, exist is supporting existing features. But I think for most of us, we focus mainly on building new features because it obviously contributes to company growth, revenue, um, and user happiness. But I think the unintended consequence is that support and resiliency within our applications is often a second thought which often leads us to feeling like this sad pug dog, which is very unfortunate. And so today we're gonna to be talking about practicing incident, or practicing um, incident response in production and how it can help us do a better job at not only supporting, but also building more resilient software. So as Caitlin introduced, um, I, am, I work at Stitch Fix on our styling engineering team where we're responsible for building and maintaining software for our 3,000 stylists who work remotely around the country. And we're constantly looking for ways to improve our resiliency as our systems become more complex as we continue to grow. And so today we're gonna be talking about injecting failure um, in an attempt, or injecting failure to be able to learn um, from the 
um, and learn from it. And so this is not necessarily a new concept. Um, we see this with doctors um, who go to med school and practice incident response, response for years in med school and their residency. I'm not quite sure why these slides are blank. Um, I think I messed up the build. <laughs> Oops. Um, second is firefighters. So firefighters obviously practice um, for months, if not years, um, in uh, fighting fires um, to be able to get people out safely in a timely fashion. And I think most engineers have gone through some training, whether in college or like for me, a boot camp or online tutorials, but I think um, very few of us have spent time working on practicing incident response um, as our sole focus. And it's not a muscle we flex very often. And so today, we're gonna to be talking about making, um, practicing incident response a priority within your team to support building these more resilient systems. And so one word to kind of describe incident response and in practicing um, simulating incidents in production is chaos engineering. It was a term that was coined by Netflix um, about five years ago. Um, and they have this concept of chaos monkey that will automatically kill containers um, within their applications, and then it's kind of forcing the applications to be able to automatically reboot. And so we have taken this kind of concept of chaos engineering at Stitch Fix and put um, the onus on the developers to kind of implement a similar strategy. And so today, um, in talking about um, simulating incidents, another word for this is chaos engineering. And so this, um, there's kind of three parts to chaos engineering. First is thinking about what do we want to simulate? What type of failure are we looking to simulate in our applications? The second is running it as a team, so we kind of want to huddle and do this as a larger group. And then that um, combined will come into our game day, so like a set time that we run the simulation with our team to be able to learn from it. And so we're going to be diving into how we at Stitch Fix have implemented chaos engineering on our own teams um, in this uh, project that I've led within styling engineering. So we're gonna be focusing on three main sections. So we're gonna be talking about how do we prepare for the simulation? How do we prepare for the game day? What type of code do we have to implement um, to make our infrastructure able to run a simulation? Second, we're gonna be talking about the actual game day. So gathering the team, running the simulation live in production and how we do that without causing chaos for our business. And then third, how to extract learnings and build more resilient systems after the simulation. So what's the output? What are we actually gaining from running this in our systems? So like I said, first we wanna th be thinking about setting up technical implementation for simulation, but we wanna be doing this weeks in advance. We really wanna be preparing and thinking about what types of failures we wanna simulate and then write the code to be able to do so. So in thinking about what we want to simulate, this can be a really personal team question. Obviously, the weaknesses in our system are very team and company specific, and they can be dependent on our technologies, architecture, and each dependent service. And so each app I like to kind of think of as its own special snowflake. However, I think as Ruby developers, we probably have generally uh, fairly similar failure points. And so at Stitch Fix, we decided to start with simulating uh, failures within our services. Uh, Stitch Fix, we have a microservice-based architecture, so instead of having one large monolith application, we have a, a dozens, um, now I think hundreds of different services that power our applications. And so services can potentially be a really critical point of failure for our systems um, and cause um, a lot of uh, downtime if they're not resilient. And so today we're gonna to be talking about simulating a failure of a service within our application. And so specifically, we're gonna be representing the failure as a 500 status code, and we're gonna be simulating a 500 response from that service. And so specifically, when the service makes the request and we get the response back, we're essentially gonna be overriding the 200 success status code with a 500, representing that failure. And to do this, we're gonna utilize middleware. And so just a recap, what is middleware? Middleware sits between every request and response that your app produces. And we're choosing it because it's in a, un 
a unique position to alter requests and responses. And we can create custom middleware classes to either alter the request or the response. And so in this case, we're gonna want to alter the response that we get back um, when making our service requests. And so middleware, um, to reiterate, is the key to how we're gonna be able to simulate downtime with one of our services within our application in production. And so at Stitch Fix, we already used Faraday uh, middleware within our application as our Ruby HTTP client uh, to make requests and get responses back in all of our HTTP calls. So for us, it was a really natural place to look into um, creating these custom middleware classes. And so for those who don't know, Faraday um, essentially allows developers to customize its behavior with middleware. And so at Stitch Fix, we wrote a custom middleware class which alters the response we get back when an app requests data from an internal service. So what does that look like? What does the code look like? So this is a new uh, Faraday um, object. You can see um, we're instantiating it with um, an options hash with the URL. Um, and we can pass in different requ request options. This is basically as um, simple as a new Faraday object comes. We just are setting the default adapter. And so we're gonna be altering what this is gonna be looking like. So we wanna create this custom middleware class. In order to do this, um, it's actually surprisingly simple. Um, so we create a new uh, simulate service failure class um, that inherits, fr inherits, in inherits from Faraday middleware. Um, you, and you can see on the on complete method, um, we're essentially just overriding the response status for whatever it is, we're overriding it to be a 500. So this is forcing all service, uh, all service response statuses to be a 500. So once we have this class, then we can go back to this new Faraday uh, connection object and call uh, simulate service failure. And so what would actually happen right now is if we uh, merge this in um, and this was in production, this would cause all service requests to come back as a fake failure. That's obviously not ideal because then none of our applications would really work. So what we wanna really think about next is how can we potentially um, segment this out so the simulation is only affecting a subset of users. And the way that we do this at Stitch Fix is through feature flags. Um, so the feature flags enable us to control who is actually gonna be a part of the simulation. The way that we've implemented feature flags, I think it can vary a lot um, within organizations, but we essentially have two different tables that hold this feature flags information. So we have a feature flags table which holds the key name for the feature flag, and in this case, it's run simulation. And then we have another feature flag memberships table where we can connect the user ID with the feature flag and designate different users to be part of that feature flag. This is really the key in being able to run these simulations in production. So back to Faraday. So once we decide, um, so once we determine that we're gonna use a feature flag, you can see up here that we pass in a config variable called simulate failure. And we set that to be true if uh, the user is part of a feature, is part of the run simulation feature flag. And so then back in our Faraday new connection object, we can see that we uh, run the simulate service failure if the user is part of the feature flag. And so this essentially is all we need to do to be able to implement um, chaos engineering within our systems at Stitch Fix. So once we have the code, what's next? We've decided what we wanna simulate. We're simulating a service failure. We have the code set up to be able to do so. Now we need to communicate out to the rest of the organization that we're about to run our game day. For us, this is communicating out to business partners and to the rest of engineering to give them a heads up in case anything um, goes awry. The next step is we want to collect expectations from our own team. So 
uh, I think most of us, when we're thinking about simulating failures, we probably have an expectation of we, what we think is going to happen. And so the way that we collected the expectations within our own team is through a Slack um, poll, which was like a really easy, low-touch way to do this. And we sent it out a few hours before we started the simulation. And so essentially what I'm saying in this poll is like, what do we think the impact of a service failure is gonna be in our system? And specifically, this is the service failure of all of our uh, client data that we show to the stylus. You can see here it's really interesting because we're not actually aligned with what we think is gonna have what we think is gonna happen. Three people think that the page is gonna kind of render, and then another uh, member of our team thinks that our application is essentially gonna crash and nothing is gonna load. And so this I think is a really interesting point to dig into that um, we thought we potentially were aligned, but once we took this survey, it was really clear that people had different understandings of our system. So now we want to kind of start, so once we start collecting this information, we want to start um, keeping tabs on it somewhere. So we, the way that we did this is we created a Google Doc to be able to keep track of all of our conversations and expectations and learnings along the way. And we started kind of talking about how we think the app is going to respond, which pages are going to load, what is the user going to see, and status codes and spinners. And this. Once we kind of set, set out the survey, this is where we kind of started digging in as a conversation within our team. Um, these conversations generally happened um, at the beginning of, we set aside like an hour long meeting to run the game day and these conversations started happening at the beginning. So other questions like what alerts are we gonna get? Um, bug snag, pingdom, what are the dashboards gonna show? What docs are gonna be available to us to, be able to resolve the incident? And are they gonna be discoverable? These are all the questions that we're really thinking about. So now that the prep is, now the prep is essentially complete for us to run our game day. We've set up the infrastructure, we have our feature flags in place, and we've collected the expectations. Now it's time to actually run the simulation. So we gather the team, we add the members, um, and we start to see what happens. So we work on a remote team, and like I said, we kind of collaborate um, all together, and we collaborate over video conference. And so the way that we did this um, process-wise is I screen shared my monitor so everyone could see that doc that we had started, and the metrics were shown on the, on the screen. And it's really important to note that being together as a team is really important, so the benefits um, from the experiences and learnings uh, Everyone gets to experience that. Again, right before we run the game day, we want to remind the business partners again, communication is key, and I think 99% of the time, things go well, but just in case, it's really important to let them know. So now that we're about to start it, our, our feature flag is still in its inactive status. We start adding users to the feature flag. And so the way that we do this is we, can, we just manually um, added them through the console um, and we're able to identify specific people that we wanted to be part of this initial simulation. So now it's time to run the command and start the simulation. The way that we did this was with a rake task. Um, it essentially just turned the feature flag um, to active um, but we wanted to have a rake task so it would be really easy to turn on, but also equally, if not more important, to be able to turn off if something went awry. So now we ran the command. Now our feature flag is active. What happens? Half or three quarters of the team thinks the application is gonna load, but one member of our team thinks it's not. And so we pull up our application, and we're sorry, but something went wrong. And so it's pretty crazy to see that simulating this failure actually caused our application to crash. And this was pretty unexpected for the majority of our team. Uh, most people thought part of it would load. But in reality, this service failure caused massive, like a full-on outage in our application. So we're already having learnings, and this is awesome. 
So like I said, everything's crashing. I also really like fireworks, so it kind of felt like an explosion type of moment. <laughs> um, and back to this, so nothing's loading, um, and it's really different than um, what the team thought would have, what, what the team thought would happen. Again, going back to the communication aspect, we really wanna double check that the simulation is only affecting the users that we thought were gonna be part, um, or that we assume are part of, the, um, part of the simulation. We don't want anyone outside of the feature flags to be experiencing this yet. So the way that we tested this is we kept one member of the team off the feature flag for them to be able to confirm that the app wasn't down for everyone, because that would have been really scary. Um, we also made sure to like ping the entire engineering team um, just to make sure and just, just to double check. And so at this point we start seeing some errors roll in, which is really, um, which is usually terrifying, but in this case was really exciting. We were able to see that the simulation was actually working and permeating through our system. So first we saw bug snag alerts. Um, you can see up here that the status is actually showing 500. Um, which is ex exactly what we were expecting. So at this point, we're like, yes, success, things are failing. <laughs> which is a feeling that I don't know if I've ever really had before, so this was really cool. Um, second, we look at Datadog. Um, this is actually uh, a random image off of uh, Google, because I don't think I'm actually allowed to show our real Datadog stuff in a live presentation that's on the internet, but essentially, um, what happens is um, we can see that uh, the simulation in our Datadog metric should show that uh, the specific service that we're simulating the failure is spiking in 500s. And one really other cool thing for those of you who use Datadog for metrics is you can tag specific, um, you can use tagging within Datadog. So we were able to tag members of the game day um, and filter by that within our system. So we were able to see dashboards only for um, the individuals who are part of the simulation. And then finally, the one unexpected thing happened is our pager duty alerts didn't go off. We were expecting to get paged. We were communicating that out. If anyone gets paged, um, it's um, the result of the simulation. But we actually found out that our thresholds were too low for alerting. So there were only a couple dozen people at this point on the simulation, and that was actually below our pager duty um, thresholds. So this was also um, to be expected, but something to kind of think about in the future with thresholds and how we're setting those. So once we go back, we see the app is still down as expected, and it's now time to end the game day. So like I said, we run this rake task to turn off the simulation, and what that's really just doing is it turns the feature flag back to inactive and the simulation has ended for today. And the game day is complete. And so at this point, um, the game day didn't last too long, but really the key learnings um, and like output of this is thinking about what we're gonna do with this information. So now we wanna think about how are we gonna extract learnings from this experience? because we obviously want to become a stronger, more resilient system as a result of this simulation. And so I think when talking about resiliency, we usually talk about our technical systems. We wanna be building applications without bugs or outages. And so through our simulations, we're now empowered to find, um, as we did in this, um, major bugs or issues um, with dependent services being down. And so we were able to learn through the simulation that if this service ever goes down, then our application is pretty screwed, like it's not gonna load at all. And so we're already kind of able to take, take takeaways and be able to add new items um, to our backlog to make our system more resilient. And so at this point, we also wanna be revisiting our expectations, like why did one person think that, it, that nothing would load and three people did? Um, how did those expectations and understandings really differ? And kind of digging into that as well. And ultimately the goal um, in terms of our technical system is to have more failure tolerance. And so, like I said, we want our systems to be more resilient to um, downtime in our dependent services. 
But I think there's a few other kind of key parts of our system. First is thinking about our process uh, resiliency. And so in thinking about this, we really want to be thinking about how we can improve the tools and knowledge available to engineers to better understand our systems as they fail. Going back to my initial uh, story of being on call um, one of the first times at Stitch Fix, I think one of the hardest parts was not knowing uh, where to find relevant documentation, not knowing where to find metrics, um, and not having the tools at my fingertips to be able to easily solve issues. And so at this point, we want to think about how can we develop more resilient processes within our team? How can we make um, our GitHub wiki pages more discoverable? How can we um, make paging thresholds at an optimal level? How can we create usable dashboards? And so we really, one, um, one way that we've done this is we have linked documentations and run books to our alerts. So one example of this um, you can see in Slack, um, this is just an automatic alert that we're getting in our team Slack channel, but you can see that we've linked our run books to specific issues. So this is one uh, pretty like low hanging fruit way to um, make that information more discoverable to engineers who are trying to solve issues. And the run books um, through these incidents, um, we can really uh, dig into what information was useful and what information wasn't um, to make these run books more useful when there's actually production issues. The other way that we can make our process more resilient is making sure that the dashboards are more easily accessible. And so one kind of key learning that we had um, while working um, on the simulation is that uh, Datadog, which is where we use, um, where we hold all of our dashboards, um, we can organize that better. And so this kind of feels like potentially a simple way to do this, but we had a ton of different dashboards that we didn't even know existed because they weren't in the same location. And so by just uh, combining them, we were able to make um, them more discoverable, hopefully, in the future. And so just to reiterate, I think the most important part here is the accessibility of process information is super important. And so when you're having a high stress uh, situation, um, you really want to make that information discoverable um, immediately as you need it. And then kind of the third part of resiliency, I think, is the human factor. And so improving our confidence and ability as engineers to solve issues as they arise. And I think through these simulations, as we practice more and more, that confidence um, will build and build over time. We'll be more confident in knowing where to find information. We'll be co more confident in being able to solve issues quickly. And I think ultimately, most teams do want to feel more prepared. Most teams want to feel more, less stressed and less anxious while on call. But like I said at the beginning, it's not necessarily prioritized because spending time in other places, like on new features, can be tied directly to business value. But I think in some ways, practicing on call sometimes feels like having, um, having insurance. Like you don't necessarily need to have it until you have an emergency. But when you have a huge outage and your team has been practicing for months, um, that's going to feel like a huge win and ultimately going to get your software and applications back up in no time. I think also the other element of the human factor is that we also want to be changing our mindset for how we think about resiliency in our systems. The more we run these simulations, the more we're thinking about resiliency and the more it's top of mind. We want to be designing systems for failure, especially distributed systems that need to account for service failures, latency, and other types of outages um, as well. And so I think through game days and practicing incident response, we learn more about our systems and ourselves. Building both applications, um, processes, and people are able to be more resilient in handling outages within our own applications. We don't want to feel stressed or confused or hopefully not incompetent. Instead, we want to feel happy, knowledgeable, and empowered. And I think that's the ultimate and very attainable goal, to build strong, technical um, process and human systems through simulating possible incidents in production. Thank you.